Good evening, Sherwood Church of Christ. Happy to be with you this evening. Um, sorry, uh, Taylor is not with you tonight, as most of you, I assume, know. Taylor and Sarah both tested positive for the coronavirus, so they will not, obviously, Taylor will not be with you tonight. Uh, both of them are doing well, but let's remember to keep them in our prayers, and many others I know have also tested positive. Beatty Berryhill, I think I heard Jenna Winchell, so we need to continue to remember them and many others in our prayers right now for what's going on. But uh, sorry, Taylor won't be with you tonight. Um, so it will be me. Um, and uh, Taylor may be, he may be back with you next uh, Wednesday. I don't know. Um, he, he obviously will not be with us Sunday morning or Sunday night, um, but maybe next Wednesday on camera. If not, then we'll see him on uh, a week from Sunday. But again, just remember to keep them in your prayers. So I'll be with you tonight. I'm gonna try to do this quickly. I know I say that every time and it ends up going long, but uh, let's uh, try to go through, get through this and then um, we will uh, uh, we'll, we'll finish with a good night. So as many of you know, um, you know, we're almost at Thanksgiving. You know, and that's a uh, tradition that as Americans, we hold near and dear to our hearts. You know, I especially found this to be true when I lived in Kenya. Uh, Thanksgiving is not a holiday that they celebrate in Kenya. Um, so every time Thanksgiving rolled around, I, I kind of I started to feel it, um, you know, because there were, we weren't doing anything where I stayed at Made in the Streets. But uh, my last couple of years there, I'd become very close friends with a couple, Larry and Holly Conway, who are missionaries there. They've been there for over 30 years. Some of you may be familiar with Larry Conway. He's actually from Odessa. He's a Odessa High grad, but uh, <clears throat> he's been in Kenya for many, many years working as a missionary. And so the last couple of years, they began to invite me and then eventually also Tasha over for Thanksgiving. And they would uh, invite all the other American expatriates, people who lived there, people who were missionaries, to come and celebrate Thanksgiving. So we got to have a traditional meal, turkey, stuffing, anything else you have traditional. We would eat it, had a great time. And it was just, it was a time for me of just remembering what it was like to be in America at this time, doing the same thing being away from family, but also to be around Americans, to talk to Americans, just about American stuff. So this is a, a really big time for Americans. Even though this year everything is, you know, kind of out of sorts. So you know, this tradition of gathering together with, with friends and, and with family for Thanksgiving began almost 400 years ago at Plymouth Colony. I'm sure many of you know this story. The pilgrims uprooted themselves, excuse me, uprooted themselves, and they sailed for America on the Mayflower, seeking religious freedom and a new way of life for their family. So through what endured, it's, it's again amazing that we even have this tradition or this holiday to celebrate. First, planning to land in Virginia, where other settlers from, uh, from England had already come, the Mayflower was blown off course, and it landed at Plymouth, in Massachusetts and it was just as winter began to set in so what what happened next would break even the will of the strongest people so there were terrible storms there was sickness that ravaged the settlers the governor William Bradford he described the first winter as that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months time half of the company had died he went on to describe how two or three people died each day, and shelter from the harsh winter was, was scant, as the pilgrims spent their time digging seven times as many graves for their dead as they built homes for the living. When the ship arrived, which was to bring food for the relief, they found that while it brought 35 more mouths to feed, it brought a not an ounce of provisions. So the very fact that we still have this tradition of Thanksgiving and that it came from these band of, of beaten brothers is actually amazing. Yet, in 1621, Edward Winslow, one of the 50 or so members of this colony, wrote these words describing their first Thanksgiving. Our harvest of corn came in well and God be praised. We had a good increase of Indian corn, and our barley crop was also good. And although our harvests are not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, 
Yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often, with that you, could be partakers of our plenty. So wanting never to forget how God had delivered them from the want, the pilgrims and their ancestors developed a tradition to remember the hard times from which they had been delivered. Whenever the pilgrims gathered for a dinner of Thanksgiving, they had a custom of placing five kernels of corn upon an empty plate before the meal was served. And each member of the family would pick up a kernel and tell that for which they were thankful. This was a reminder to them how during that first winter at Plymouth, food was so scarce that each individual was rationed only five kernels of corn each day. So for us, as, as Christians, we should always remember even the most dire and worst of circumstances, we put our reliance upon God. So today, as we, as we look forward to Thanksgiving, let us take these five kernels, put them on the plate, and let us remember why we should be thankful for God. You know, this is a hard time for America right now. Not just America, the world. Many people are in quarantine. Um, many people have lost jobs. Many people can't go and celebrate a traditional meal of Thanksgiving with their family for fear of infecting them or someone getting sick. And so, and this is a really hard time for people right now. Many people are struggling and suffering, whether it be, uh, you know, physically because of the ailment, or whether it be uh, loneliness from not being able to be around family, or maybe it's because they lost a job and they're struggling just to survive and, and help their family. This is a hard time. We're going through hard times. So we need to stop, I think, today and remember why it is that we should be thankful. Even though everything seems bad, why can we be thankful? So today, that's why we're going to be looking at First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 1. Um, it's also similar because Paul is also writing in hard and dire circumstances for himself. And he's reminding the church in Corinth why they can be thankful for what God is doing. So we're, we're going to look at that. So in this passage, 2 Corinthians 1, 3-11, Paul bursts forth with thanksgiving for the comfort that has come to him in the midst of his distress and his affliction. And not only is the good news that Titus has brought him from Macedonia about the Corinthian church, so then Paul goes on to show whether he's afflicted, whether he's comforted, everything turns out for good. So Paul's words are a reminder that, that our experiences and our struggles encourage us to have faith and hope and help us to trust God. You know, it's interesting that one of the paradoxes of the Christian life is that the grace of God is most keenly experienced, not in the best, but what seems to be the worst of times. However much a Christian longs for rejoicing, it is often in humiliation where he finds grace. Paul writes in this book, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And this kind of goes throughout this letter. And one of the key words that we're going to see in this letter, in this whole book, is the word comfort or encouragement. The Greek word here used for comfort or encouragement literally means call to one side to help. The verb is used 18 times in this letter, and the noun 11 times times. In spite of all the trials he experienced, Paul was able, by the grace of God, to write a letter saturated with encouragement. What was Paul's secret of victory when he was experiencing pressure and trials? His secret was God. So let's look. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Excuse me. So, titles, theme, time of Thanksgiving. Here's the verses that we want to look at this morning. So it says, 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So here Paul again, writing a letter to the Corinthians, telling them, even despite our struggles and despite our circumstances, God can use us and bless us, not just us, but also to be a blessing to those around us. And so I just want to look at this passage because of the hard times that many of us are enduring to remind us why, even though it may not seem we have anything to be thankful for, we have some things to be thankful to God for. So if you want to open there, um, but here's, uh, again, I'm going to try to go through this quickly because I don't want to keep us all night. So first, I think Paul is telling us in these verses, we need to remember what God is. We need to remember what God is to you. You know, as Paul opens this letter, he begins by, by praising God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord and Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. You know, so Paul maybe here could not sing about his circumstances, but he could sing about the God who is in control of all circumstances. You know, Paul had learned a lesson that we all need to know that praise is an important factor in achieving victory over discouragement and depression. And so here he tells us several things that we should be praising God for. And I'm going to go through them really quick. So we should be praising him because he is God. And this is all in, in verse uh, 3. We should be praising him because he is God. You know, here the phrase... Praise be to God or blessed be God is, is found in two other places, in Ephesians and in 1 Peter. And they all happen to be one, one and three, chapter one and verse three. In Ephesians, it's talking about the past when God chose us in Christ and he blessed us with spiritual blessings. In Peter, it's about the future blessings that we'll receive through a living hope. But here in this passage, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is praising God for present blessings, for what God is working and accomplishing right now. So praise God because we know he's alive and at work. Praise him because he's God. Secondly, praise him because he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, back in verse 3. It's because of Jesus that we can call God father and even approach God as children. God sees us in his son and loves us as he loves his son. So whatever the father did for Jesus when he was on earth, He's able to do even for us today. We're dear to the Father because His Son is dear to Him, and we are citizens of the kingdom of His dear Son. We are precious to the Father, and He will see to it that the pressures of life will not destroy us. So be, bring praise to God because He is the one who brought Jesus to the world, which brings us our salvation. Three, praise Him because He's the Father of mercies. The, the word here for father literally means the originator of. So we know Satan is the father of lies, John 8, 44, because all lies originate with Satan. We know that God is the father of mercies because all mercies originate with him and can only come from him. God in his grace gives us what we do not deserve. And in his mercy, he does not give us what we do deserve. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. 
You know, the, and the Bible frequently speaks of the multitude of God's mercies, that that supply is inexhaustible. So praise God, because he delivers mercy that we probably don't and we do not deserve. And then net finally, praise him because he is the God of all comfort, really, which is what this passage is about. The words comfort or consolation, they come from the same root word in Greek, are repeated 10 times in these verses. Now, we don't want to think of comfort or consolation in terms of, of sympathy, because that can weaken us instead of giving us strength. God instead places strength into our hearts so that we can face trials and triumph over them. You know, the English word for comfort comes from two Latin words, meaning with strength. The Greek word, as I said earlier, to come alongside and help. So God can encourage us. He can comfort us by his word and through his spirit. And even sometimes he uses other believers to give us that comfort, that consolation, that encouragement that we need. Wouldn't it be great if we could all be named Barnabas, son of encouragement? You know, when our circumstances are difficult and you're, you become discouraged, it's easy to, to focus on yourself. It's easy to look inward, to think about your own feelings, or it's easy to, to focus solely on those problems. But Paul here is reminding us that our first step is instead to look up by faith to the Lord and realize all that God is to you. The psalmist writes, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So not only do you need to remember what God is to you, we also need to remember what God does for you. So again, we look at these verses in 2 Corinthians, the verses we read. Paul here is addressing some of these issues, the things that God does for you. First, he permits trials to come. Now, there are 10 basic words, excuse me, for suffering in the Greek language. And Paul uses five of them just in this letter. And the one that he most frequently uses is the word philipsis, which means narrow, confined, or under pressure. And in this letter, it's translated affliction, tribulation, and trouble. So Paul kind of felt hemmed in by these difficult circumstances that he was undergoing. And the only place he could look was up. You know, there are some, some troubles that we endure simply because we're human and we're subject to pain. But there are other sufferings and troubles that come because we are God's people and we want to serve him. We must never fall into the trap of believing that the trouble that we're undergoing is an accident. You know, those are divine appointments, things that God has allowed to happen in our lives so that we can be made more full. And we can be made more like Jesus. You know, there's, there's kind of three different outlooks, I think, that a person can take when it comes to the, to the trials of life. If our trials are the products of fate or chance, then our, our only choice is to give up. I mean, no one can control fate or chance. If we have to control everything ourselves, then our situation is equally hopeless. But if God is in control and we trust him, then we can overcome any circumstance or trouble placed in our way. So God encourages in all our tribulations by teaching us from his word that it is he who permits trials to come. So God is the one who's permitting those trials to come. So what is, you're thinking, oh, how does, how does that help me? Well, one, because now we know who is in control of trials. You know, Paul in verse eight writes, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. So here Paul is weighed down like a beast of burden with a load that is too heavy for him to bear. But God knew just how much Paul could take. And uh, he kept the situation under control. We don't know what this specific trouble was that Paul is talking about, but it was great enough to make Paul think that he was going to die. But we know that despite those circumstances, God was in control and protected his servant. So, one, he permits the trials to come. 
but we know that God is in control of those trials. And then thirdly, God enables us to bear our trials. The first thing that God must do is to show us how weak we are in ourselves. Excuse me. Paul was, he is a gifted and experienced servant of God who had been through many different kinds of trials. And we read that throughout the gospel, I'm sorry, through the, uh, the epistles that he writes. So you would think that surely all of this experience would be enough for him to face these new difficulties and overcome them. But here God wants us to trust him. Not our gifts or abilities, our experiences or our spiritual reserves. Just about the time we feel self-confident and we are able to meet the enemy, we fail miserably. In chapter 12, verse 10, Paul writes, For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, when you and I can die to ourself, then God's power can go to work. It was when Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead physically that God's power enabled them to have the promised son. And here when I say dying to self, it doesn't mean just waiting for God to do everything. Instead, I mean, you can picture Paul praying, searching the scriptures, talking to his Christian friends, and trusting God to work. So the God who raises the dead is enough for any difficulty that you or I might go through. He is able, but are you available? So we see that God permits the trials, God's in control of those trials, and then he gives us the strength and the power and the ability to bear up under those trials. And then God delivers us from those trials. You know, we see Paul saw God's hand of deliverance, whether, whether he looked back, around, or ahead. And so the word Paul uses in this verse, in verse 10, means to help out of distress, to save and protect. You know, God doesn't always deliver us immediately when we ask, nor does he deliver each of his children in the same way. James is beheaded. Peter is delivered from prison, Acts 12. Both were delivered, but they were delivered in very different ways. Sometimes God delivers us from our trials, and other times he delivers us in our trials. So God's deliverance here was in response to Paul's asking and his faith. And then finally, God is glorified through our trials, which is the whole purpose of why these trials ever come into our lives in the first place. God wants to be glorified through what we are enduring and going through. So when Paul reported what God had done for him in verse 11, a great chorus of praise and thanksgiving went up from the saints to the throne of God. People were praying. Um, uh, he, he's saying, and because of your prayers, I've been delivered, and that many will give thanks on our behalf because of what has happened. You know, the highest service that you or I could ever do here on this earth is to bring glory to God. So when you're enduring those trials, bring glory to God. So God works out his purposes in the trials of life. If we yield to him, trust him, and obey what he tells us to do, difficulties can increase our faith and strengthen our prayer life. Difficulties can draw us closer to other Christians as they share burdens with us. Difficulties can be used to glorify God. So when you find yourself in these trials of life, remember what God is to you and what God does for you. And then finally, as we get close to finishing, remember what God does through you. So not, not, only, um, not only am I, am I asking you to, um, excuse me, to remember who God or what God is to you or remembering what God does for you, but I want you to think always about remember what God does through you. You know, in times of, of suffering, most of us are prone to, to think only of ourselves and we forget others. We become cisterns instead of channels. We collect that living water that we've been given instead of delivering living water to others. Yet one reason for trials is that, is that so you and I might learn to be a channel of blessing, to give comfort and encouragement to others. Because God has encouraged us, we can encourage others. There's a story told um, 
there's a story told of, of a, a longtime preacher, um, Dr. George W. Truitt. And he was asked to preach the funeral of a young couple who had just lost a newborn. And he, this couple, they were not Christians. And so he was asked to perform the funeral. And so in this time of not only performing the funeral, try to give them comfort and encouragement and, and God's working in this whole situation. And, you know, he was very happy to report that months later, this young couple found their way to Jesus and became Christians and became believers. Well, it came months later, the same thing happened. Another young couple was brought to him. They had lost their young one, a little baby, and he was asked again to do the funeral. And try as he might, he kept trying to bring them some kind of comfort and consolation. And he was really struggling. And the day of the funeral came, and this mother of this little baby that she's lost is, is weeping. And this mother, that the same preacher had delivered comfort and consolation two months back, comes forward, sits down, puts her arms around her, and she tells this woman, I understand your pain because I have been through what you've been through. And as God brought me through my pain and suffering and brought me comfort, I'm here to do the same for you. And so Dr. Truett could say, actually and said that, you know, what, what would take me months, maybe even years to bring, this woman could bring instantly because of her understanding and the comfort that she could bring because of understanding and going through the same situation. You know, this, the subject of, of human suffering is it's not easy to understand. There, there are mysteries to the God's working that some things we, we just won't grasp until maybe we get to heaven. Sometimes we suffer because of our own sin and rebellion, as Jonah did. Sometimes we suffer to keep us from sinning, as was the case with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. Suffering can perfect our character, Romans 5, and it can help us to share the character of God. Hebrews 12, but suffering can also help us minister to others, which is what that story was about. Just think of the trials of, of King David, um, the, the things that he had to endure in order to bring us great encouragement that we can find in the Psalms, which I read earlier. 2 Corinthians 1.7 again, in this passage here, it makes it clear that there was going to be a possibility of the situation reversing. Instead of Paul being comforted, it could be the Corinthians needing to be comforted by Paul. And so the Corinthian believers might need to go through trials and also receive God's grace so that they might encourage others. So God's gracious encouragement helps us if we learn to endure. Patient endurance is an evidence of our faith. The ability to endure difficulties patiently without giving up is a mark of spiritual maturity. You know, God has to work in us before he can work through us. Learning God's truth and getting it in, into our heads is one thing, but living God's truth and getting it into our character is something totally different. You know, think about the story of Joseph. God put young Joseph through 13 years of trials and struggles and tribulation before he made him the second ruler of Egypt. And think about what kind of man Joseph was, or he became. You know, God always prepares us for what he is preparing for us. And a part of that preparation is suffering. And then in verse 5, it, it makes it really clear, when we suffer in the will of God, we are sharing the sufferings of our Savior Jesus. You know, the trials that we endure because, like Christ, we are faithfully doing the Father's will, suffering for righteousness' sake. So, as we remember, as we remember the things we are thankful for during the season, despite all these struggles that are going on in this world, despite the coronavirus, despite the lockdowns, despite our economic woes, and I'm not here to be little or, or make those things seem any smaller because they are huge and they're big. And we all have reasons to be frustrated because maybe we can't go see our family. I want us to just stop and just take stock and think about those five kernels that are sitting on that plate. And I want you to pick one up in your mind and I want you to just think, what do I have 
to be thankful for today. Paul tells us here in 2 Corinthians, hey, remember what God is to you. Remember what God does for you. And remember what God does through you. Don't forget the important thing is to fix your attention on God and not on yourself. Remember what God is to you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Remember what God does for you, that he is able to handle your trials and make them work out for your good and his glory. And remember what God does through you. and Let him use you to be an encouragement to others. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening. I pray that your Thanksgiving is a blessing and you have fine time to be a blessing to others. I pray that you take time to stop and be really thankful for what God done, what God has done in your life. Again, I pray, I hope that you'll join us on Sunday. Uh, worship class is at 9, worship is at 10. Um, and then again, we'll meet again at 5 o'clock on Sunday night. We would love to have you come and visit us. If not, join us online. And again, if there's any way that the, the Sherwood Church of Christ can be a blessing to you and help you, please let us know. Again, thank you so much. God bless.